Pure joy. James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. Every once in a while, when someone does a sermon, they'll say, oh, this sermon is really for myself. You know, I'm preaching to myself. Whenever I hear that, I always thought, well, why don't you just do that on your own and preach to me about things that I need to hear? But um, this one, I'm not preaching to myself. It's not for me, but um, it's for my daughter. Uh, now, given that she's you know, around some of your ages, so I think this applies to you guys as well to some extent. So, so pure joy. What do you think of when you hear the words pure joy? So, of course, I googled it. Here's an image. Pure joy. Two girls giggling, happy. My daughter was once that age, I suppose. But she's much older now. Almost tall, as tall as I am. Here's another picture. Uh, I, I think it's a hamburger in his mouth, and so he's, you know, pure joy there. He's quite, quite happy, quite satisfied. Yeah. And then <laughs> one more, <laughs> just this will kind of <laughs> freak me out a bit. <laughs> it's like, whoa! <laughs> but hey, pure joy, I suppose. Um, and then along the along those themes, uh, we have course, pure joy, and certainly do want to congratulate the four seniors that have graduated. Yeah, round of applause. Yeah. Especially to those that actually showed up today. <laughs> but um, So pure joy. You, you think about pure joy and you think happy thoughts. You, you think, you know, giggling uh, little girls, uh, the dog that's got a mouthful of food. And big buggy eye baby. I, I don't know if that's pure joy. Um, and certainly graduation. I mean, th those are all joyous occasions uh, and everything. But when you look at James chapter 1, verse 2, it says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers whenever you face trials of many kinds. So you don't really associate trials with pure joy. Okay. So, what in the world is James talking about? And by the way, there, there's some dispute as to who James exactly is. Um, there are, there's James that or the apostles, but most theologians believe that this James is not one of the apostles, so there's some debate on that. But um, for the most part, I think most people agree that it's uh, the brother of Jesus. Um, so, but so James writes, "Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds." Now, again, trials aren't going to be pure joy. But you do notice the verb that starts the sentence here that says, consider it pure joy. So you are to think of it as pure joy. Why? Because you know, because you know, that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Well, if you didn't know, now you know. Okay. So, when you have these trials... Your faith is being tested. And when your faith is tested, it develops perseverance. That's James 1.3. If you think back to Romans 5, verses 3 and 4, you might remember that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope. So these are some of the steps that lead to uh, hope from perseverance. So perseverance, even though it started out in this case with suffering, eventually leads to a good thing. Hope. Leads to hope. Okay. Now, when we talk about testing of your faith, 
Some of you might recognize what this is. It's called a litmus test. And you see that strip of paper um, that would be yellow. And then, depending on what you dip it in, it'll change color based on the pH level. Okay. So this litmus paper is used to test the acidity, in this case, of whatever liquid you have. Now, if you don't test using the litmus paper, you're not going to know the exact acidity level. So unless your faith is tested, you're not going to know where you're at with your faith. But getting tested isn't enough because maybe some of you have experienced when you take a test, you might fail. Hopefully none of you fail on a regular basis. But uh, So when our faith is tested, what do we have to do? Well, we know that it produces perseverance, but we have to let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. So we have to persevere. We have to let it finish. We have to persevere to the end, whatever the end may be. And at that point, you become more mature and complete, and you don't lack anything. So the verses that Sonny read, verses 2, 3, and 4, it talks about the fact that, again, you have these trials which we are to consider as pure joy, and then testing of the faith develops perseverance, and then perseverance, we have to let it finish so that you may be mature and complete. So if you think back to why the trials are occurring in your life, it is so that eventually you can be more mature and complete. That is the intent. For as long as you let perseverance finish its work. Of course, it implies that there is a possibility that you don't let it finish its work. Then you won't be as mature and complete. So we need to make sure, hold on to the faith, and let perseverance finish its work. <coughs> you can think of it as Vaccination. The, the kid's way too happy to you know, get a shot. But um, When you get a shot, when you get vaccinated, you, you're actually getting a small amount of whatever the virus it is in your system. So you're, you're getting the disease into your system. But what happens is, it, it's small enough though so you can handle it. Right? But once that virus comes into your body, your immune system starts to work and it gets strong, stronger so that subsequent times when the actual disease hit you, your body will be ready. So you can think of trials in that manner. You're being vaccinated. You're getting a shot. It hurts, of course. But two things to remember. One is that it won't be as bad as you can't handle. Right? These vaccinations, it's not so strong that you're going to be knocked out by, you know, by the actual disease. Right? Otherwise, the kid wouldn't be so happy, I suppose. But it'll be enough dose for you to build your immune system so that when something really bad happens, you'll be ready for it. So that's why these trials are occurring. And as you know, I you know, went back to Boston for a few days, and it was quite a trip, um, quite eventful. But uh, and one of the things was uh, my family just moved because now that my son's off to college, they don't need the two bedrooms, so they're moving to a one bedroom. Uh, but then they had to move before I got there, so they had to do everything. But then my wife has to work, so pretty much it's my kids that have to do the moving. And my son really isn't into helping out that much, as I'm sure most of you, most of the guys are. So my daughter is kind of stuck doing a lot of this stuff. And, you know, as I was just talking to her about this and that, and, and you know, she was starting to complain about how 
she had to deal with all this stuff while she's still in class. Right? My son's a senior, so he doesn't have any classes anymore. But then, you know, he's off just you know whatever, doing whatever he does. Uh, while my daughter, when she still has classes, she's got to deal with moving and organizing and everything. And there's so much stuff, and they're trying to put it all into a one-bedroom apartment, and it's just you know, the Koreans use the phrase uh, it, it means like the, the whole place looked like it was bombed, right? And it's like stuff all over the place. You, you have to dig around to figure out where the sofa is and stuff like that. Um, I actually wanted to have my wife cook me some, uh, you know, dinner and stuff, but there's so much stuff that there's, you can't find the dining room table. There's no way to eat. So, um, but as my, my daughter was complaining about these things, and she was, you know, um, basically crying and saying, you know, why do I have to deal with this kind of stuff at this point? And, you know, honestly, not a whole lot I can do at that point, just, you know, hug her and, you know, kind of, kind of it. But, um, so I started to think a little bit more about, okay, from a biblical perspective, what could we think about? You know, how do we face this situation? So that's where I came up with uh, looking at James chapter 1, verses 2, 3, and 4. And, um, you know, just like I said, you know, trying to find ways to just console her in some extent. Um, and it, in the process, if any of you are going through any particular trials, then hopefully you'll be consoled as well. But I do want to move on with uh, James chapter 1. There are a few more things that I wanted to talk about. This is the next verse, <coughs> James 1, 5. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. So it might seem a little bit odd, all of a sudden changing topics from perseverance to uh, wisdom, but if you think about it, the connection there I think in order to persevere, you need wisdom. You need wisdom to get through whatever the situation it is that you're dealing with. And true wisdom does not come from the world, but it comes from God. God is the only one that will give you the true, true wisdom. Remember we talked about Solomon and his wisdom and how he asked for wisdom when God said you could have anything you want. So it is a very important thing. It is a very valuable thing to have that allows you to persevere. And that is why it is mentioned in the verse that comes right after talking about perseverance and, let it, and letting perseverance finish its work. But it's not quite as simple as just asking. There's a little condition to that. And that's the next verse. But when he asks, he must believe and not doubt. Because he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. So, remember we sang oceans. Now normally, I would choose th that third song. But this time because of the trip, and, and I was supposed to come back uh, Saturday night, or Friday night, so that I can have Saturday to prepare for everything, uh, but it was the last flight, and the flight got canceled, so I was actually stuck in Boston, not that it's a bad thing, you know, my family's there, but, uh, so I actually had to stay there another night, um, which in turn gave me an opportunity to have dinner one more time with my family, so that was a good thing, of course, but... Um, what that meant was me coming back basically last night, uh, I would have to do everything that I would normally do on Saturday afternoon overnight. So actually I have zero hours, or zero hours of sleep uh, since uh, yesterday morning. But So if I ramble on, that's why. <laughs> but uh, Oceans, <laughs> back to Oceans. Uh, that song I did not choose. But of course, God has his magical ways and talked about how you walk on water in that song. Well, 
I was going to talk about how, it's hard to read maybe, but this was a scene where, um, you know, you have Peter looking at Jesus walking on water, and it says, oh, I want to I do that too, but, and he started to walk on water, right, and that's where kind of the oceans talks about walking on water, but uh, in uh, Matthew's chapter 14, verses 30 and 31, he became frightened, and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus stretched out his hand and took hold of him and said to him, You of little faith, why do you, did you doubt? So doubting is going to have this negative effect, right? You're going to sink. When you ask for wisdom, if you doubt, well, is God really going to give me the wisdom that I need? Guess what? It says in the next two verses, that person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. So when you ask, you cannot ask with any doubt in mind. Now that, of course, requires faith. But we know that God is going to give you the wisdom that you need. So just ask without any doubt. It talks about being double-minded here uh, in James uh, chapter 1, verse 8. Maybe some of you remember this from last week, actually. Uh, this also comes from James chapter 4, verse 8. Come near to God, and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. So those that are double-minded do not have a pure heart. So you're, you have kind of, you know, maybe you trust God a little bit, but then you're still thinking, well, maybe it's not going to happen. You're, you're doubting, so you're double-minded. And that's not going to work. You have to wholly devote yourself and believe that God is going to give you the wisdom that you need, and he will give it to you. Uh, there's this section here that comes after. Now, I, I was kind of thinking about maybe just skipping these verses and go to verse 12, but um, I'm sure James wrote these verses for a reason, so... You know, I'm kind of scratching my head trying to figure out why all of a sudden he's talking about rich people and humble circumstances and such. Um, and if you also think, just if you read the thing, it, it makes no sense almost. The brother in humble circumstances ought to take pride in his high position, but the one who is rich should take pride in his low position. So implying that someone in humble circum circumstances, meaning poor, is in high position, Whereas someone who's rich is in low position. Now certainly the world does not operate that way. The more money you have, it seems like the higher position you're at. But James here, and really throughout the Bible, it talks about how you know, the poor are lifted up and are blessed by God. Right? Now, I'm not implying that all the rich people are, are going to be you know, just done away with. But it's where they focus their attention on. If they pursue worldly desires and try to be rich in a worldly manner, then it goes on to say here, He will pass away like a wild flower, for the sun rises with scorching heat and withers the plant. Its blossom falls and its beauty is destroyed. In the same way, the rich man will fade away even while he goes about his business. So the, the, the rich man is not even going to know that he's fading away, but he will. Now again, you know, I was talking to my wife about, you know, a little bit about money and stuff. Um, and, you know, certainly I make a lot, lot, lot less now as a youth pastor than I used to before. Now, and my wife's saying, well, you know, she wants to make money. Okay, what are you going to do with it? Oh, she wants to support missionaries. You know, she wants to uh, you know give money to church and you know help the poor. It, it, wonderful. You know that that sounds great. You know, philanthropist. That's all good. 
But ultimately, where is your heart going to be at? And the Bible tells you to store up your riches and uh, treasures in heaven, not on earth. So I'm not saying making money is a bad thing. Certainly go do it. But what you're going to do with it, if you're going to keep yourself rich, then you're going to wither away, as it says here in verse 11. And then verse 12, which is kind of the punchline of this whole section, and the one that I wanted to you know, close up with and uh, focus on. Verse 12 says, Blessed is the man, is the one who perseveres under trial, because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. So here is the ultimate goal. Why do we stand the test? Why do we persevere? Because by doing so, we get this crown of life. We get eternal life. And, you know, because it hasn't been that long since we've had this discussion about, you know, Calvinism and Arminianism, you could make some arguments here. But to me, it seems like it implies that there is a possibility that you don't stand the test, which means you will not receive the crown of life. So we must persevere. If we do not then we're not going to get the crown of life. Now, whether we persevere because you know, of our choice or God doing that for us, whatever. But the important thing is that we have to persevere. Right? These trials are going to come. Yeah. And it's a way of testing our faith. It's the litmus test to see where you're at in your faith. If you're not tested, you're not going to know where you're at. And from personal experience, once you get over one particular test, you're going to be tested again, and it will be harder. It will be for an even greater thing. But in that process, your faith is growing. Remember the vaccinations. You get a shot, you can handle a little, a little disease. When you're ready, you get another shot. Maybe they can handle a bigger disease, and so on and so forth. So trials are going to come. It's happening to my daughter. Maybe it's happening to you guys. If it hasn't happened yet, you don't have the opportunity for pure joy. I know you're supposed to consider it pure joy. right? But it's an opportunity to test your faith and also to grow your faith. So... If you are in a particular trial, rejoice. Remember, rejoice always, right? Consider it pure joy. It's an opportunity to see where you're at with your faith and also for your test, for your faith to grow because as you persevere, you'll recognize that your faith is growing. Then, oh. If it seems like there's a trial that's just too hard, know that God will give you the wisdom that you need to overcome. You have to ask for it without doubting. Because if you doubt, you're not going to get it. But if you ask for it without doubting, God will give it to you. And with that wisdom, you can persevere. You can get through it. And as this verse says, once again, once you've stood the test, ultimately at the end, you're going to get that crown of life. So, as... Ben plays a little something. Let us come before God.
And ask for wisdom. And do not doubt. Whatever trial that you might be going through, just lay it down before God. Just confess to God that this is hard. But with the wisdom that God will give you, that you can overcome it, you can endure it, you can persevere. And if you haven't been tested, you really don't know where your faith is. So ask God to test your faith, not so that you can fail, but so that your faith is stronger. Yeah, we're looking here at the words for oceans. And like I said, this wasn't planned, but it says right here, Spirit, lead me where my trust is without borders. Let me walk upon the waters wherever you would call me. Take me deeper than my feet could ever wander, and my faith will be made stronger in the presence of my Savior. So if you're just playing in the kiddie pool the whole, you know, whole time, that is how deep your faith is going to be. But ask God to take you into the oceans, take you deeper, so that your faith will be that much stronger. And if you know of someone going through trials, pray for them. Please pray for my daughter. And if you need prayer, ask someone to pray for you. Ask me to pray for you. And together, our fates will get stronger. So we can all be jumping into the oceans and not doubting, not being afraid. Heavenly Father, thank you for testing our faith. We want our faith to grow stronger. But Lord, we can't do it on our own. So we ask for wisdom that only you can provide that can help us get through any trial and so that we can persevere and know that our faith is growing and we can rely more and more on you so we can get deeper into the ocean trusting you without any fear. Thank you for always being with us and helping us and guiding us. Pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.
to him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ, our Lord, before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen.